All right. I've got the YouTube genius here, Tom Breeze. Tom, say hi. Hello. We're going to talk about the biggest opportunity on YouTube right now for business owners. All the stuff that he's done over the past 10 years and now gets ROAS, return on ad spend of 10x, and how he doesn't usually do that as a kind Brit. The value of a lot of subscribers, how to get more quality, high quality leads. The best spaces for YouTube is your client on YouTube. And the real question you should be asking, the most important piece of a great YouTube campaign, the metrics that he looks at, the best types of ads to be running, the magical of time amount of time before people trust you and the magical amount of time before people will buy from you. Uh, Tom is shifting his testing in the three core things that they look at, plus his seven step educate model. And man, we've got so much more the, and all about the best software for picking your YouTube videos and making them better. All this on the garlic marketing show, but don't forget one of the best videos you can use throughout your marketing are your customer stories, video case stories. You can go to videocasestory.com to learn more, or you can get the book video testimonials that land the big fish at testimonialbook.com. All that on the garlic marketing show. So let's get started. Tom's an expert in YouTube ads, building out a software. So you can go to viewability.co. He's worked with people like Perry Marshall, James Schranko, built tons of brands, been doing YouTube ads and Google ads. How long have you been doing YouTube ads now for? 10 years as of last month. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a while. It's and enough man, time for me to know yeah. a little bit about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you have images of the old YouTube ads anywhere? It's like almost <laughs> antiques now, right? <laughs> I've, I've got images of me with less gray hair. That's what you're asking for. <laughs> no, but like the old YouTube layout and stuff. It was like, yeah. I was looking another day and I was talking, I was talking about that SNL skit that made YouTube big lazy Sunday. And I looked it up and I'm like, oh man, I forgot YouTube used to look like this. <laughs> yeah. I've got some trainings back in the day of like SEO. I've got snapshots of SEO results. This is a YouTube ranking at number one for this keyword or something. And it was like the oldest version of YouTube you can ever imagine. <laughs> so crazy. So yeah, we have been doing it a while. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, but you've seen a lot and I'm excited to talk to you because I think YouTube has, we knew it was going to happen, but really YouTube's taking over marketing. And mm -hmm. it's a huge opportunity. So I, I want to talk about how you're building channels and how you build subscribers. I think that's how a lot of people want and get clients for obviously your clients. But what do you see as the big opportunities right now in YouTube? Good question. I think that the doubling down on longer form content mm -hmm. is great for business owners. I think that there's a lot of attention on short form content for multiple platforms, Reels, TikTok. YouTube shorts, and that serves a purpose and it's great for awareness, but from a business standpoint, I still feel like there's pieces of it are yet to be mastered. So the big opportunity I see for business owners that are looking to get big on YouTube is not to worry too much about how big the brand is. I want the brand to come along for the ride for sure, hundred percent. But I'm looking at paid acquisition strategies that are saying, if we pay $1, we get more than $1 back on YouTube still, but what's the best way of doing that? And it just so happens the best way of doing that right now is to put great content out, longer form content that you would be happy and proud to have organically available. And then you put some ad spend behind that. And that as a strategy is working really well. I would say that I've been doing this for 10 years. And of all the stuff we've done over the last 10 years, we've done some stuff that really scales up and we spend a lot of money every single day. This year, we've got some incredible results where we spend less money and can start at like five to ten dollars a day and get ROAS of 10x which is I know that sounds so claimy and hypey and I'm, that's coming from a Brit as well so that's a very unusual <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah from from all of the activity that we've done over the last 10 years I wouldn't say that we've hit this higher ROAS goals for clients I like return on ad spend it's just been phenomenal and yeah we just look at YouTube very differently because Paid media is one aspect of YouTube, but if you can get that earned media and that owned media, so have a big brand, have that big YouTube channel, we've got lots of views and lots of people recommending the channel. If you can start to get hold of that, then you start to realize that your paid acquisition strategy can feed that. And then you get this really big growth. And that's what I'm really trying to double down on and focus on. And it seems to be working really well for clients. Yeah. And Kasim over at Solutions Aid, we were talking about that in our last episode. And he really, he said his best performing top of funnel ad was 56 minutes long. 
and she's running ads to a 56 minute video and people, and I tell people, I'm like, long form content works if it's good content, if it's informational and you get it targeted. And when you're, yeah. he's saying too, it's 90 days. When I talk to Marty at Bad Rhino, it's 90 days before you even get an inkling. And then a year, it's really where it's getting on plane. I mean, when you say 10X ROAS, I want to talk a little bit about attribution. Tell me a little bit about what that means when you're getting, is it down the funnel? Is it, are you, yeah, so, what type of companies do? Yeah, of course. So I'm primarily talking about companies that have content they can share that's engaging content. Like it's, you could put a video out that's educational and if it's 10 minutes in length, people are going to stick around and watch that video because you've got something to share. You've got expert advice. You've got insights that no one else has. You've got something to share and something that's useful for your audience. That's you don't have that. This strategy is going to be very difficult, but I think most people have something to say, but you can go down that organic route that people like Kasim have done exceptionally well. And there's other people that have got, so Kasim, I consider one of those channels where he's growing the channel when it hasn't got the most number of subscribers in the world. I wouldn't say like it's the big yeah. channels like that you have seen with Alex Ormosi, for example, you've got these kind of channels that have smaller subscriber base, but the value per subscriber is really high mm -hmm. and the value of owning that asset as a channel is ridiculously powerful for the business. So subscriber numbers, I see as sure there's a part of vanity to that. And also there's a part of this is a big brand and yeah. there's that shortcut in people's minds that will make where it's, oh, wow, you've got over 500,000 subscribers. You must be doing something correct. You must have a great business, a great. Yeah. And so it feeds into that for sure, but you can have very small numbers of subscribers and still have a really powerful asset for your business with YouTube. The way that I view YouTube is that I want to get to that point where organically we've taken off and the algorithm loves us and every video we put out there gets a hundred thousand views and so forth. The, and I think that it shouldn't be, it should always be like the North star. We're focusing on that direction for sure. It's just that the path to get there is long and hard and arduous <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. not straightforward. And I don't know if it's I'm lazy or if I'm just no advertising really well, but I'm almost like, can I spend a bit of money just to speed this journey up a little bit? And that's where I come in. I suppose that's my focus is to say, I want to create a channel that's ridiculously valuable and serves our users really well and serves YouTube really well. So we know we're playing that game long term, but short term. And for the medium term, I'm saying, I'm just going to put a bit of ad budget behind some of these videos that I create and see how it works. And that's where you can say you can put like $10 behind a video. Someone watches an hour long video, perhaps, or a 10 minute video or something where they get enough time to get to know and trust you and will consider buying from you just for the fact that they spent a lot of time on your video. And then they clicked to go to the website to see what you got. And they might sign up or they might buy something from you. But that activity of putting a little bit of ad spend behind great content is a tremendous way of generating customers from YouTube and being a really reliable source of traffic that's high quality as well. So you get the benefit mm -hmm. of the quality of traffic you get from YouTube and you get the control of saying, I'm going to pay for more eyeballs and it's going to be worth my while doing it. So that's the, that's where I come in is to say, can we shortcut that journey and grow a YouTube channel much faster with paid ad spend? Yes, you can. And it doesn't hurt organic growth at all. So it, it's so far so good. It's a great strategy. I'm happy to unpack as much as you want of that. Yeah. And that's kind of like where I sit with YouTube. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's great. And I think you talk to the quality of the people on, on YouTube because I, what I think most people don't think about is they think about YouTube in one way or shape or form, but it, it is both an intention and an attention platform. And there's mm. people going there to learn. There's people searching YouTube for answers, but also they're going there to be entertained at the same time. And so you, yeah. you've, and that's what, because then, like you said, the organic people you go, they find the answer and then they go off and watch their cat video, but they're still seeing your videos too. I, that's why I think tick, YouTube will win over TikTok. Like when I look at a TikTok feed, it just feels icky, <laughs> but YouTube it's okay. Here's a cat video, comedy video. Oh, here's the thing you were learning. And like, okay, I don't feel as bad about myself. I really want to see why you're still getting cat videos. That was like 10 years ago. <laughs> you just got a, a penchant for cats, right? <laughs> yes. My wife sends me cat videos and I send her cat videos. And also... <laughs> okay. Oh, no, I understand why. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but in, and there's probably some other stuff in there we won't talk about. When you The types of clients you're seeing this work for right now, who are you working with? Who is it working really well for? Yeah. Okay, cool. Good question. So 
any niche or niche that you're in where there's a natural YouTube audience, then it makes life very easy to get good results. So let's say, for example, you, and the, the easy way to work that out is you just type in a keyword into YouTube that you think your customer might type in. And when you do that, you look at the results and you want to make sure that each video has a, an average of around about 10,000 views or more. Sometimes it could be way more than that. Sometimes it's a lot less than that. But if it's around about 10,000 plus, you've got something where you're like, you should be playing in that field. You should be, you should be on YouTube. You're going to get great results with YouTube. So if let's say, for example, we work in the any financial field, that's going to work pretty well because people go to YouTube, they're looking for information. And there's a lot of YouTubers giving good content and good value around financial information. And that could be from trading the stock market, trading Forex, trading like all the trading stuff, it could be investing in property. Those two niches do incredibly well on YouTube. It could be how to manage your money. That could be to do with setting up a trust. It could be any information where people are like, I want to find out more information about this so I can make it more informed decision to then go buy something and or go in do some level of activity. So it might be like, I want to go invest in the stock market, for example, give me some basics or some beginner guides, or give me more advanced information, depending on what your audience is looking for. Those sorts of niches do really well. Anything business related, so marketing related operations, anything to do with sales and marketing tends to perform very well. Anything to do with operations and SaaS products, you get a lot of SaaS products and operations. So like Asana, those sorts of products and those types of things, or CRMs and that, that type of thing all can work very well as well. The is again, it's about giving good information, good advice. And it, there's an audience on YouTube already looking for that. Now you could go into the hobby space. So people looking to play golf, learn the guitar, kind of anything that would be like arts and crafts, for example, we've made that work really well. It's a little bit tougher because it's a B2C offering and the the value per customer doesn't tend to be quite so high because if someone's buying arts and crafts, it's very different purchase <laughs> yeah. than if you're like investing in the stock market or if you're buying something for your business, for example. But uh, yeah, you're going to look for those businesses. If you're, if you're a business that considering YouTube, if you've got a B2C market, great, or like a B2B, but a small B, so it might be like a small business owners. I wouldn't go and try and use YouTube for corporate business necessarily. Mm -hmm. Then I would look at, trying to be B2C, trying to make sure that you're in that information space so you can give good information and you have might have products or like courses or services you provide to people. Ecom can work. It's just you have to have an educational piece around the products you tend to sell. It's a, that one's a little bit like ecom is a little bit more challenging on YouTube, just naturally. Again, we've yeah. made it work multiple times. It's just, it's not like info. It's a lot easier to sell consulting, coaching services, those types of things on YouTube than it is a physical product to be shipped, but partly because of the margin and partly because of the value that you'll have per user. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. I, but I'll tell you, I have seen some clients really go and beat a big business landing big huge clients off of youtube yep. i think because everyone's on youtube I, it, it's funny to me everyone thinks oh my clients are on youtube but i'm like who isn't on youtube because it's like i know 75 year olds that want to be influencers right <laughs> yeah as a, so i think if you were to take a consideration of saying who isn't on youtube i think correct everyone's on youtube it's more a case of are you going to be able to get that content in front of your ideal market cost effectively? That's the gotcha. bigger question. Is so. Let's say, for example, you're selling heavy machinery to farmers. I don't know. That's <laughs> on the spot, considering that. Okay, so can you can you get in front of farmers? Yes, you could, and but you'd have to think about what they're already looking for, what they're searching for, and is there a big enough market for that? I have no clue about that niche, by the way. I don't know if that's a good market or not. But then it's like, cool. You can get in front of them. Great. Can you then start educating them on the heavy machinery that you've got? Now, it might be, let's say, for example, it's a combine harvester. That's my extent of how much I need to know about the farming industry. That's, That's more than I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's probably other products, but I, like a tractor. Okay, I know two things that you would buy as a farmer. Great. Anyway, the, I really should have picked a different niche here. Anyway, the product, the product you have there will probably be ridiculously expensive, a huge investment, a long lead time to, to purchase, but one purchase might be worth 
5 million to you or something like that. And therefore it's like YouTube a good investment. That's one. If the sale came on day one and you made 5 million, you didn't make a sale for another year, then great. But if you advertised for a year, didn't make any sales and then made two sales on day one after the first year, you'd be like, oh, YouTube does actually work. So it's for that's a lot more of a, a difficult one to say that YouTube would work really well for you going after big corporate contracts and go for yeah. big sales of things. Whereas if it's like a, a product that lots of people are buying, it means it's a lot easier to advertise and see the numbers come in really quickly and then scale up. It's yep. just a lot less risk involved, I suppose. Yeah, that talking to Kass and we're talking to Marty or Ben Rhino, it's a year long commitment. It's once it starts working, because that's what those types of buyers, they're looking for a year. They're looking for two years. And I think there's a huge opportunity that and that's where I think also building up your subscriber base and the things that you're talking about can work for pretty much anyone. It's just, it's how long's your buy cycle and what's that customer worth? Exactly. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about the mechanics of what you're doing right now. What, how is this working? How are you growing channels and landing these clients? Yeah. Okay, cool. So the process of how, which ones you want me to tackle first, how we get clients or you want me to kind of like talk about no, how we no, service more so like how you get clients for your clients. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, cool. If let's say, for example, we start out with understanding whether a client has, let's think about what we're actually going to do. So the whole process we do is we say, we need to make sure you've got good content and it might be like a 10 minute video. That's what we aim for. So you do your bit of research, make sure that there's a search query or there's some, some people looking for some information about something in particular. And you say, cool, we've got some keywords. We know what the people are searching for. They're like, cool, we know that there's a viable market here and there's enough traffic to go around. Can we create content about that will be relevant for a client's offers? So then you say, cool, yeah, it looks like people are searching for this and you have a product that kind of services that thing. It's cool, we've got a match made in heaven potentially here. And then it's like saying, right, now we need to create the video for that. Do we already have one? And the funny thing is most clients that are on YouTube already might already have a great video that you can say, great, we can start there. You put your heart and soul into a content piece that you did six months ago, and it might not be getting much traffic now, but that doesn't, that view counts to this strategy is irrelevant. All I'm interested in is if people do watch that video, how much of the videos do they watch? And it's not watch time I'm looking for, although that is a key part of that. What I'm really looking for is the retention of the viewer to say, how long do they watch for? And how many people watched for a long period of time? Because if you have a large proportion of your audience watching past five minutes, I'm talking about like 50% of your viewers watch more than five minutes. That's a great video. That's good content, yeah. good value that people are loving. If you have 40% of your audience watching past eight minutes, that's also a great indicator. So that's like some benchmarks we'll tend to look for. And then I'm like, if it's got a call to action in that video, then great. We're off to the races. We've got a great video to go already. And we might put some ad spend behind that. Now, if they don't have a video already, and you and this is for a lot of people that come our way, they're like, we want to crack YouTube, but we've never really done it properly or never really put our heart and soul into it. How do we get started? Then we do have a, a video format called Educate. Happy to walk through it, which is how to create a really good video that's content rich, that also has a call to action within it. And it's going to, you're going to put it out there. It's probably the first time you do it, a bit of effort. The second time you do it, it's so much easier. But once you've done like a video, two videos, five videos, perhaps, as soon as you've done your first one, you can start to put some ad spend behind it. And the beauty is that when you do the ad spend, you use a strategy called in-feed video ads. So most people are familiar with YouTube being the in-stream video ads, which is where you press play on a video and before you can do anything, you see this ad that pops up in front of you and you have to wait for five seconds before you can press the skip ad button. Those are called in-stream video ads. But you have a different type of video format called an in-feed video ad. And that's where the thumbnail of your video appears at the top of the search results. Or if you're watching a video, it'll become on the right-hand side. And it means that you... As an as the advertiser, you're paying to get your video thumbnail and title all over YouTube for when people type in keywords, if that's your approach, and they have to be the right demographic, so male, female, gender, typically, and also the location. So you can say, am I targeting just a local town, or am I targeting a whole state, a whole big territory, or a nation, or international? You can go as wide as you want with that. And so you choose your 
advertising settings, so to speak, but you're going to use Infi video ad. And really all you're doing is you're saying, I'm just going to get the right people who are in search mode for what it is I've got. I'm going to make sure my video shows to those people. And if they press play, then I have to pay the money to get them. Like, that's where I pay. It's like a pay-per-click almost or pay-per-view. But as soon as they press play, that's when you spend your money as the advertiser. And then your job is to make sure that they stick around to watch the video. And the reason why I want people to stick around for eight minutes is because if people watch eight minutes of your content, something psychological happens. It's they get to know, like, and trust you after about five minutes. But around about eight minutes, it's difficult to test this, but we've done the best we can to kind of try and measure it with all the results we've got. We know so around about eight minutes, people start to ask themselves, I wonder if this person's got something to sell and I'll consider buying it and making sure it's a good offer and things, of course. But they're already starting to think, I wonder if I can buy something from this brand or I wonder what they what services they have to offer. So you, you I'm sure you've done it in sales calls before. You give a strategy, you, you show them what we are doing. They're like, this that sounds amazing. All right how can we work together? What products or what services do you have? And that's what we're getting people to. And that happens around about eight minutes if you structure your video correctly. And if you can already do that, and then you put your call to action at the end, the people that would decide to click to go to the site will be primed and know the price points, know what it is you have to offer. And so you do the whole sales pitch somewhat on YouTube. You might leave your testimonials or guarantees or bonuses for the website, but your website becomes far more transactional now. And YouTube is the whole relationship building stroke sales pitch all on the platform. And yeah, we've been putting those videos together and it's been working really well, but it's quite simple. You say, what are the search terms? Can you create a video for that? Make it as sticky as possible and then put a call to action in front of them. And that's the whole process, basically using in video ads. It's a simple process, but because uh, th- it's about the quality of the content and yeah. that's not the easy part. And so how are you making sure it's that eight minutes of great content that are you adapting it? Are you making multiple versions of the videos? Are you testing out different themes? Yeah. So we tend to go for volume of production rather than volume of testing. Because the video is going to go live on the YouTube channel. You want it to get that organic lift and have lots of people view it. And so you don't really have the luxury of doing lots and lots of split testing like you would with a typical direct response short ad, for example. Mm -hmm. If you get a winning ad as a direct response advertiser, you're going to be like, let's try out five different intros and then test out which one works best. Now do five different outros and then and you keep on testing and tweaking. So lots and lots of iterations or version editing it's called where you keep on improving things or trying to improve things spending a lot of money on testing that's one way of doing it yeah we've been doing that for 10 years we know that model really well yeah yeah. whereas now i'm like we know we can pretty much hit it on point around about 80 percent of what's possible with that content i'm like cool that's good enough because now we're going to move on to the next video and to cover off a different topic or a different theme and now we're going to the next video so what you're doing is you're just going and trying to create the best content you can, but not having to necessarily do lots and lots of split testing because you're like, that's it. I'm shipping that. I'm good with that. Move on to the next one. And it's amazing because you're doing a more of a brand play with a call to action rather than just pure direct response. We have a formula that we've, we so we built a bit of software and what the software does is it analyzes every bit of content. And so it'll look at your videos and see multiple things, but three core things. The first thing it will do is it'll look at all your videos and see what part of the video has the highest level of retention that held the audience for five minutes. And then we can rank those across your whole channel and see which one works and which ones don't. And then we transcribe them. And then we say, cool, we know what content to talk about because we've got the stickiest content from your channel already. Then we'll look at all the intros and typically people screw up their intros. So we tidy those up and then the outros or the call to actions most people screw those up as well well and I, i'm i'd say most people including me i screw it up all the time oh, yeah. as well so i'm not alone well, people are not alone if you look at your data and it doesn't look how you want it to look because there's so much improvement that can happen yeah. but the that's what we do is we pick out the best contents so we're like this is what your customers love hearing from you they never leave when you talk about that stuff that's really good and now it's improved the intro and the outro to make that content really strong but as we, now we've done that so many times over with so many different brands, we've adapted a system that we had called Educate to fit with what really works to just give it a lot more structure. So we have a Educate is our framework for our video and it's seven points. 
and uh, now feel like I should go through those, but feel free if you want to stop me or ask <laughs> oh, me no, questions. Oh, no, keep going. I want okay. to hear. <laughs> cool. Okay, so what we do at the start of the video is A stands for attention. So this is an acronym, educate. So A-D-U-C-A-T-E. So A, the first A is attention. So we've got to grab the viewer's attention from the very beginning. It sounds obvious, but there's some really unique things to do with YouTube. So with YouTube, you want to make sure the first three seconds aligns with your thumbnail and your title. Because remember, they've just seen your thumbnail, they've just seen your title, and what they want to have that is that certainty that video is going to be about that thing. So you want to mention whatever the title of the thumbnail is right at the start of the video. Let's keep going because I'll combine yeah. this all together. Because then what you want to do is get into content as quickly as possible. So the thing that like the thing with organic content is that people don't want to be sold and hyped up at this very start. They want to feel like this is going to be great content. And they want to get into it as quickly as possible. The longer you hype it up, the more people leave. So you just got to get into content as quickly as possible. Now, what we tend to do is, let's say, for example, I'm talking about educate. I could write it on a board or have it on a slide deck or, or something where I'm like A-D-U-C-A-T-E. And I've concealed part of the model, but I'm saying we're going to walk through educate today. And I'll do this in the start of the video to show you exactly how to put, the, to put together the best video you've ever put together, for example. And I'd have educate maybe behind me on a board or with me on a slide, for example, so that you're showing people there's more content to come and you're going to unpack something for somebody. But that's instant. They see the image. That's all they need to see. You might briefly mention it. But let's say, for example, I'm going to talk about YouTube advertising. I might say, all right, let's talk about YouTube ad strategies. And then my number one strategy that I'm going to unpack using this model called educate. That probably took me three or four seconds, but I've done two things. I've told them what the video content is all about, and I've shown them the model and they're like, Cool. I get it. Let's get into it. And that's literally what I'm saying. So let's get into it. And I'll start teaching immediately. So I might be four seconds in, five seconds in, and I've begun teaching. That's one of the biggest things I can recommend to people because most people have a logo spinning around or uh, <laughs> introduce themselves. No one cares about, like, no one cares yeah. about me at least, but no one, no one cares about the presenter until you're giving great content. So that's really important. Now, not to say that we ignore more attention grabbing pieces, but we just, in, we fuse into the next piece. So you want to talk about moving towards a goal, moving away from pain, all those sorts of things as well to get people really engaged and, uh, and knowing why the content is so powerful. But then what you want to do is as soon as you're on the attention, you move into the D of educate, which is your demonstration. Now this is your content. So you want to be teaching people why it's so important, what you're going to share with them, how it works and what this really means for them if they do it. And you're going to unpack your content in such a way where it just feels like insightful, valuable content they haven't seen anywhere else before. And it's packed out. It's like you unpack the educate system. So it's got structure to it, and it's got a system or a blueprint or a method or something that people feel like there's a model here that I can follow and know where all the pieces go, and it doesn't feel overwhelming. So that will be the next thing that that's probably going to take five to eight minutes of content, but that's the part where you're proving out to someone, you know what you're talking about and they feel like this is the value they wanted from the video. And you're going to infuse it with some of the attention grabbing stuff as well. So you want to talk about like why this is so important, who they become, give them an identity and some status around now knowing this information, who they're becoming. And so that might take you up to about eight minutes and that's really your video. And then everything I'm talking about, from here on in, so the U of Educate, you've got U-C-A-T-E, that's leading into your sales pitch. So this is going to be quite quick, might be condensed down to two minutes, but the U is unique. So here is where you want to talk about how you developed that model in the first place and why it was so important for you to do it in the first place. Like, why did you create it? Why was it so important to you? And you want to share your values with people. Like, this is really important to me because... This is the whole reason I got into this to begin with. And you want to share your unique point of view. So I come from a psychology background and I come from a mathematical background as well. So whenever I look at YouTube advertising, like we had a big breakthrough recently because of the mathematics of YouTube ads and what YouTube have been changing recently. And that's really the root cause why people are having a problem. And that's what I want to get to is share people my background, how I found the root cause of the problem and why it was so important for me to develop this model for people. And that's the unique aspect of making this model so valuable that you need to share in the unique aspect of this. Because once you've done that, you may, you really want people to go, oh my God, I get it. I get why I've got this problem. Because as soon as you do that, you also disqualify any other products out there 
because that doesn't tackle the root cause. Sharing with people the root cause and how you've tackled it with this model is really valuable to people. Then you move on to the C, and that's your customers. So your customers are either people that are going to go and do something, or they're uh, dabblers, so to speak. You can call them different things. So you can call them people that are like, we call them pioneers or observers, for example. You want to show people that some people just know it and will get it, want it, want to do it. And they're often running. They're like, yep, show me where to go. I want, I'm ready to buy something now. Great. Those are, There's those sorts of customers. That are, and you can say, those are the people like us. People like us, we do things like this. But there are also people that dabble or observers. They sit on the sidelines, aren't ready to commit just yet. It's normally because they're fearful or they have a level of, I, it's the fear, but it, I tend to explain it like they've got a level of protection mechanism within them because they've probably been burnt before. We all have. We've all done something, thought we're onto a winner, and then it blows up on our face or we thought we, I don't know, we can have these different things where we paid a lot of money for something and then it didn't work out or yeah. whatever it would be. We've all been burned. And because of that, we are slightly fearful and we then become information gatherers and never really take action. And that's understandable because the brain is, don't do it. You've done this before and it didn't work out. Don't do it again. Don't make that same mistake twice. And so we we can all be one of the two identities. We can either be a pioneer and go do this thing or an observer or we can be a doer or a dabbler like whatever you want to call them and you might want to classify this for your clients as well but you're polarizing the audience to say you're either one of us being a pioneer or you're an observer each is fine you can be either one and it'd be understandable to be either one but let's focus on trying to be a pioneer here let's move away from being an observer and to be a pioneer because if you set it up in such a way where they want to be a pioneer you can show them that the way to do it is to start taking action and commitment. And that's something like, okay, cool. As long as they feel comfortable enough to move forward because they believe in the system, let's move ahead. And so you're showing them the pathway to becoming a pioneer. Now, as you do that, you're also making the whole sales pitch that you're about your product is now about identity and not about clicking a link and buying something. It's like saying, if you decide to do something with us today, you're telling us that you're a pioneer. If you decide not to do something with us today and not click the link, you're an observer. And either is fine, either is good. Like you might need to be an observer for a little bit longer. That's all good. But you're at least making this decision about the identity of the user. And they feel that tension then because you can't really get evergreen tension like urgency or scarcity into a YouTube video because you can't say, this video has been live for five years now, but for five people only, it's a great <laughs> strategy for someone. It's like, you've got to use tension around their identity. That's the piece to do it with. So that's the customer. And then you move into the A of educate, the second A, and that second A is adapt. So the, the adapt piece is like, when you first built this model or this system, this blueprint, whatever it is you shared with people in the D of the demonstration piece, you want to unpack a slight drawback something that was when you first created it did, made the product not perfect now you want you don't want to pull on the efficacy or like how effective the product is because that's like unquestionable that it the product does the job no no questions about that is done it found out the root cause and it fixed it and it works really well for people cool but there might be something around it that made it inaccessible for people. Maybe it was too expensive. Maybe it took too long to implement. Maybe it didn't really integrate very nicely with products. Maybe it was complex. Maybe it was just inaccessible for some people. So like you had to work with me one-to-one -one in the UK to get this job done or something. Whatever it was like, didn't work for everybody until you then worked on it. So you show that slight drawback. And then you said, because of my values, I wasn't happy with this. So I went back to the drawing board to fix this. And because of the new thing we have included, it now works for everybody. It's a lot faster, cheaper, more accessible, simpler, integrates nicely, whatever it would be. So you show them that you fix that problem. And then the T of educate is trust. So then you're going to say, because of that fix, look at all the accolades we get. We now have been appeared in, all this product has appeared in multiple magazines, got loads of testimonials, great reviews, whatever it would be. Show, showing off basically and showing how great it is. And then you move into the last part after that and saying the exit is the call to action. So it's, if you want to go do this, here's how you go get it. You click the link, you might mention the price and you want to really just future pace the, the journey for people. So once you click and get into this page, you know, it's going to look like this, fill in your name and email and your 
credit card details or whatever it be. And you have the products landing on your doorstep in 24 hours or whatever, or it might be an online course. And so just instant access, whatever it might be, but you really want to unpack it for people. So they feel like they know what the whole journey is. And the re the reason why we put the price point in there and show them exactly what it's all about is because we only want qualified clickers going through to the site. Because when it comes to in-feed video ads, you're going to be paying for a view. And so you want to qualify the audience anyway. But if the video works really well, you can run it as an in-stream video ad. And then if you have a far lower click-through rate, but a high quality audience clicking through, mm -hmm. your cost of advertising will plummet. You're going to have a far cheaper cost to run your ads if less people are clicking. That's one of the biggest things that have broken through from YouTube in the last couple of years is that the big reason why people are having a problem with YouTube advertising in the same way as it's always been is because YouTube paired click-through rates with CPMs. And so as your click-through rate increases, your cost of advertising increases. And so you need to make sure you do the opposite. You reduce your click-through rate on purpose, and then you, which will reduce your cost of advertising. But then you know that anyone who does come through is worth so much more because they convert and they pay at a much higher level. So yeah, hopefully that unpacks how to create a great ad. And that was, that's what was working really well on YouTube. It's really, that's simple. I'm going to go do it right now. <laughs> done. <laughs> it's simple. It's not necessarily easy. And it's one of those things too. Yep. It's like you said, you were saying like, oh, I make mistakes in my intros and outros. That's why I think if you're going to do this, have someone to talk to like yourself, because it's almost impossible to really make really great content and run YouTube ads on your own, just because you're too close to it, especially if you're really an expert, aren't, isn't it? It is. It's like, sometimes it's, when you're, uh, what is the saying? If you're inside the bottle, you can't read the label type thing. It's, yep. It feels like that sometimes where you can't even see the most obvious thing right in front of your face when you're creating your own content. Cause you're like, actually, I like this content. It's, your viewers don't. And, and that might be fine. You might say, great, get it out your system, create the videos you want to create, and then you're good. And now create the videos that your viewers want to have. And they're like, yeah, now that works much better. Great. But it, it's, um, that's why we built the software because it, it just highlights it with pure data. There's no, it's just purely objective. It's it's not, we're not looking at it from a standpoint of giving our own advice because we think that would work well. It's look, the data's in front of you. You can literally make decisions based on what's working for you, what's not working for you. You can fight it. Sure. I don't mind that, but you might as well go with the flow of what your viewers are wanting. Yeah. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to win. And uh, I would say that the, the way to approach YouTube in this day and age, I really feel is that long form content, create the content that your viewers want and put it in front of the viewers that you also want to have buy your products and services. And it's the, the value of someone watching five minutes of your content. It might cost you like 20 cents or something to get someone to watch five minutes of your content. Compare that to doing a short ad, really hypey and claimy, click through to the site, sign up for something. You might get a lead then you have to email and nurture that relationship. But the lead might cost you $20 versus costing you 40 cents or 20 cents to get someone to watch five minutes of your content. It just makes so much more sense to build that relationship on YouTube, get them to know I can trust you. And then off their own back, they're thinking, I want to go buy something from you. And that's where I feel is the opportunity on YouTube these days. I think that's, it's been the opportunity for a long time is, hey, people have a problem. They're going to YouTube to solve it. And YouTube knows that. And puts mm. that video in front of the person. And now it's your chance for them to see your face, like, and trust you. So that, and that's, once again, comes back to that attribution problem. You're not going to have mm. as direct an attribution rate as you are with other types of services, are you, with YouTube? Yeah, that is the one drawback. There's, I suppose there's two major drawbacks from this strategy. One is the attribution thing that you talk about. Like, you... Unfortunately, humans don't act like robots. I wish they did sometimes. But the way that it works is that if you watch a great video on YouTube, you might say, this is really good. And you might click and open up their web page and think, yeah, I probably will buy this actually. And then before you do, you might say, do you know what? I'm going to watch a couple more videos from these, this producer, this content creator. You watch a couple more videos. You're like, yeah, this is actually really good. Let's go to his website or her website real quick. Then you go to the website and you're like, oh, actually, they've got this other thing going on over here. <laughs> okay, cool. Actually, wait a second. And then before you know it, they might say, okay, I'm going to make my decision tomorrow and I'll choose. They go on Facebook. They see another ad from that same brand because now it's a retargeting brand ad on Facebook. They click that link and they go and buy something. You're like, good luck trying to attribute that back 
comfortably yeah. back into your CRM and know exactly what happened. It's just not going to be a smooth journey because you're amplifying your organic content. You can track it through cookies and other specialist ways you can do it, but it's not easy. It's not, no. and I don't think attribution ever will be easy. It gets murkier and murkier. And if you try and make everything linear, it costs you a fortune. So it doesn't make yep. any diff, make many sense, makes much sense to do it that way. So attribution is getting murkier and it's just, it's leaning in a little bit and being like, do we really need to know every single touch point as, lo as long as we are tracking it in different ways that you feel comfortable enough to be like, we spent hundred dollars here and somehow we made to, we made a thousand dollars. I'm going to have to attribute some of that back to YouTube because we've just turned that on. So there might be that piece, which attribution becomes a little bit murkier, but the other one is the other drawback is the scale. So we've just figured out some good ways to scale up activities using this strategy, but up until recently, it's been very much like we can get great numbers up until around about 500 to a thousand dollars a day. And then you start to push the, that system a little bit too hard and the numbers don't always work out as well as we want it to. So you, you find your comfort zone around about $500 a day that is really profitable. And then it's, you want to go and spend 10,000 because you like get all excited, but it doesn't work out as well as you want it to until we've worked out some clever ways of growing the audience and you have to be really specific, but you use kind of custom audiences in a very specific way. And then you can start to scale up a little bit more and get to probably five X spend of what you were at previously. So it's a strategy that does scale, but it's, it takes a bit more effort to do that comfortably. So there are workarounds about attribution and scale, but it starts to get a little bit more complicated than the early days of just making things work at less than $500 a day. Yeah, but it's getting your face and your voice in front of someone, especially if you're in any type of service business over and over again, that's invaluable. And no yeah. other platform can do that. I get Facebook can, but you're not going to be consistent. Yeah. You very rarely hear people saying, oh, I see your ads all over the place from every platform, but you do get that from YouTube. And that, and I know it's just anecdotal, but people say, oh yeah, I see all your ads on YouTube all the time. I hear that so often. And it doesn't cost you much to get that impact and people get to, and if it's good quality ads that they're seeing great content from you, like, oh, I see you all over YouTube, your content's great. They'll never forget you. You've built the yeah. brand. You've generated that trust with people. And yeah, it's huge to get that in place. Huge. I've heard it for myself, but I'm all from all of our clients and I'm sure you've seen it. It's like people come in pre-sold to work with yeah. you. And it, that's the other part about it too, is like, they're not asking how much they're asking, can, may, like Cosmo said that too. April over at MedSpot Growth and said that too. It's like people come in, they're like, oh, can I work with you? Not how much is it going to be? Yeah. And that value alone is immense. 100%. And also, I would say about this strategy as well, which it's really nice for me. And I think it's a lot and for many other people is that if you are a natural direct response presenter and you can do the hype and the and you can really get the script perfect and just have the energy for it. And some people are just naturals at it. Great. But you have to be ridiculously good at that nowadays to make YouTube work. Like you have to be ridiculously good at sales and pitching and knowing how to say things in the right way and use the terminology. And I'm like, that's reserved for a very small percentage of people. Whereas great content, that's my forte. I Hopefully people are liking this content, but that's where I feel like is my forte. I can give people content and strategy and insights and advice. I can do that on mass and it sure it might not be the best call to action in the world, but I earn the trust from people. So I just want to do business with that guy. And that's where I feel is the beauty of this strategy for many more other people where it's if you're an expert that has advice to share with people, but aren't necessarily the best at selling in the world, who cares? Like, it doesn't matter. In fact, some of our best videos are not salesy at all. They don't have call to actions in them. It's just that people love the content. They're like, I want to go buy this thing or I want to go yeah. investigate this business a little bit more. And uh, yeah, some of our best videos are not the perfectly designed videos for sales. It's they're just great content and people want to do business with those brands as a result of providing that content. Yeah, so true. It's just providing that value in the right way and being authentic about it too, where they can trust you and they feel it. And so you mentioned your software. Tell us about, can, is it open to the public? Can we get a hold of it? Yes, it is. And we're going through some iterations. So by the time people, this comes out or something, it's probably going to be super, super duper. <laughs> it's already pretty cool. So what it does, if I don't say it to myself, there we are picking up my own stuff before I even talked about it. <laughs> but the, so yeah, what the, the, you can go to the x-ray.io. It's also on our main site, viewability.co. 
So you can go, you go there and what we have is a tool whereby you connect your YouTube channel. Really simple, just works through the author and Tate. Oh, I can't even say the word. I'm going to say you can just connect your YouTube channel before I try and start that, <laughs> saying it again. And so you connect your YouTube channel and what it does is it draws down all the data from all of your videos. And then we run it through a system to clean that data up basically, and then display it in such a way where you've basically never seen the software, never seen your data displayed in a really clear, coherent manner. You can get some of the stats from YouTube, but you'll be flicking around on every single video and trying to gain it, gain it insight from it, every single video and really difficult to use YouTube analytics. So this one grabs all of the content, lays out every single video and shows you the retention rates of every single video from not just watch time and viewer retention, but every percentage point of a video, like how well did it do at every part of the video? So the first part of the video, the last part of the video, which parts of it, but then you can rank it from all your videos. You can say, which one was my best content? Which one was my worst content? And so it informs you for the future, like wow. create more of that content and less of this content, but it will show you how to optimize every single video. And then we just got it connected with AI and ChatGPT now. As it does that, it can draw, it can take the information from each section of your video, transcribe it, summarize it, and then create a new video for you about the same content that you, we know is really strong, but give it a new intro and new outro. And it just makes the whole process of video creation in the future so much easier because you can say, next video I do, it's going to be just like this, pretty much scripted. I'm going to go and present that. I'm going to upload that as my YouTube video. And yeah, it's, it means that you're taking the very best, optimizing it, and then creating new content. And it's going to be content that's so good that you'd be like, I want to promote this. And that's what we do as a service as well. So we either help people and show them how to promote it, or we consult or train people. And then we also have our agency offering around that as well. But yeah, the tool Everything itself is really valuable. Everything around YouTube at viewability.co. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. And besides YouTube, where else do you spend your time online, Tom? Where can we follow you? Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can follow me on Facebook, YouTube. I'm there as well. So just type in Tom Breeze and I'm sure you'll find me and uh, those sorts of places. I, Facebook and YouTube are my stomping grounds, so to speak. I try not to get involved in everyone because I'm just not very good. I'm just na not naturally a social media guy. I don't find it very easy <laughs> to be like, take a picture of everything I'm doing in my life. Not, I find it so difficult, but long form content once a week. Yeah, I'm good with that. That's good for me. <laughs> nice. Put a link to all of that in the show notes. Uh, this has been fantastic, Tom. This is a masterclass. If there ever was one, I really appreciate you being on the Garlic Marketing Show. I know everyone else does. We'll make sure they connect with you. But thanks again, Tom, for being on. Of course. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for taking Tom and I on your journey. This has been I and Garlic and the Garlic Marketing Show.